All right, so on to disk management. So when you get a hard drive, um, the, one of the first things you usually have to do to it, unless it comes already done, is you're going to have to format the hard drive. And there's kind of different levels of formatting you can do. The, the most basic one is the physical formatting, our low-level formatting, and that's what actually divides the disk into sectors that the disk controller can then access. Because remember, you're gonna, the requests are going to be coming in on a per-sector basis. Um, when you, if, if you've ever done low-level formatting yourself, um, you may well have realized you have this capability. Um, you can actually determine how many bytes are going to go into each sector. It's going to have to be a power of two usually. Um, so a very common value is 512 bytes, a half of a K, but it could be bigger than that. You can make it 4K, something like that, if you wanted to. The sector actually has to hold more information than just the data. It's also typically going to have to hold um, some error correction code, which is extra bits that are going to be tacked onto each sector, which will help the uh, disk controller determine if a uh, sector has gone bad or not, if the data has been corrupted there. And it's going to have to be some header information as well, which is what the um, hard drive controller is going to use to determine where the boundaries of the sectors are. Um, so a, if a disk is going to be holding files, then the operating system will need to record its own data structure on top of the disk. So this is the a logical formatting, a higher level of formatting that occurs on top of the existing low level formatting. Um, usually what this involves is in some sense kind of creating a file system on top of the hard drive that is a sort of a, a higher level uh, understanding or representation of the data that's stored on the hard drive. Um, one of the basic things that we do typically with a physical drive is we partition it into a set of groups of cylinders. Each of those groups of cylinders would be treated as a logical drive. So for example, you might choose if you wanted to put two partitions on a hard drive, if the uh, hard drive consisted of say a thousand sectors, or sorry, a thousand cylinders, you might choose to have um, uh, cylinder 0 through 499 be one partition and 500 to 999 be the other partition. But, uh, and you've probably seen this when you've partitioned a hard drive yourself, then that's viewed from the file system when you look at, at your browser or something like that, then you'll see that you've got, you know, it lo looks like you have two drives attached, but really it's just two logical drives or two partitions that are attached. Um, to increase efficiency, most file systems are actually going to group the blocks or the sectors into larger quantities called clusters. Um, and the disk I.O. is still working in blocks because that's what the hard drive is doing. But the file I.O., if you're working with a file at a time, that's working with clusters. So a file is usually going to be um, represented as a section of blocks. The blocks, we can consider those as sectors of clusters. It's kind of like the difference between um, the logical and physical memories we, when reviewing with, with uh, virtual memory, different memory models. So the file I.O. is done in, in sets of clusters, and the disk I.O. underpins that, and that's done in blocks. Some special, special applications want um, raw access, raw disk access to the hard drive because they want to do their own block management. They don't want the operating system to intervene because the operating system is just going to try to optimize things sort of in a general way for lots of kinds of applications. But if you know that your machine is, your server is typically running only one kind of application, in particular like a database, then you may want the application to have direct control over the hard drive because it can kind of know best how to optimize use of that drive. Another special feature which you have to have in your hard drive, especially like on a PC or something, is you need a way to start up the system. So uh, when the system is first turned on, when you turn your computer on, you need to somehow move the operating system, which is resident on the hard drive, and get it loaded into memory and running on your RAM. And this is usually, there's a boot process that actually can make this work. Um, at its simplest level, when the machine first boots up, there's going to be a very simple program, a bootstrap program that's stored in the ROM of your system. So that's the first thing that will happen is that little program will be loaded from the ROM uh, and it could be executed directly from the ROM or it could be loaded into the RAM and executed from the RAM. But the, what that's then going to do is it's going to go to your hard drive and it's going to try to pull the operating system that you want to load from the hard drive. Um, so then that situation might look something like this. This is kind of how it works in Windows. Um, the lowest level track, the lowest sectors in the hard drive, store what's called the MBR, the master 
something, I can't remember the MBR, master, master boot register, master boot record. And um, that basically consists of some information, a boot code, and a, and a, a, the, a table that defines the different partitions that have been set up on the hard drive previously, that logical partition that we talked about. So that information is stored in these low order tracks up here. The boot code is basically going to indicate which partition you want to boot from. So the partition table will say which cylinders define which partitions. The boot code will tell you, well, which partition do I actually want to boot from? And when you go to that particular, whatever partition you set up to boot from, there's going to be stored in the low-level uh, cylinders or low-level sectors of that partition will be another program called the bootstrap loader. So that program will then be loaded into the RAM and will be executed, and that program will run, and that's actually then going to go and pull stuff, pull the actual uh, operating system, the kernel code, off the same partition and go ahead and start that running. So it's actually a, a fairly uh, complicated process of actually getting the boot to going. But um, when you, uh, in your operating system, if you have a system set up, we have multiple partitions like the machine I'm working on right now, I can boot it either as a Unix machine or as a Macintosh or as a PC. So I have three, actually more than that, but I have three bootable partitions sitting on the hard drive of this laptop. And I can, through the operating system, I can manipulate the value that's going to be stored in the boot code up here so I can control when I next reboot the system which of the partitions are actually going to be booted from. Um, another thing which I should mention just a little bit in passing is that most, um, when you are, when you are um, formatting a drive, um, typically part of that formatting process also establishes a set of sort of spare blocks that are kind of set aside. You're not going to use them to store any information in them, but they're used to handle bad blocks when they occur. Your book actually talks uh, at some length about how sector sparing and sector slipping work. And so um, I'd like you to go ahead and read up on those techniques because it might be something that I ask you about on the exam. But sector sparing is a fairly simple idea. You basically have a table on the hard drive that keeps track of which sectors have gone bad. And if a sector is marked as bad, then you typically have a redirection from the bad sector to one of these spare sectors that you've set up. And so when you want to access that bad sector instead, you get redirected to one of these hopefully good spare sectors. All right, now another thing which is common that hard drives are commonly used to support is virtual memory. We talked about that in the previous chapter. Um, in this case, uh, if you're going to do virtual memory, you need a place to store, to swap your pages to and from the hard drive. Now, that's kind of a special purpose use of the hard drive because you're typically swapping these fixed size chunks of information, a page, um, from, the, from a frame onto the hard drive. And because the amount of data you're swapping is in this, these fixed chunks, there's typically special purpose algorithms you can use and special purpose ways you can partition or, or, or segment your the information on a hard drive to make the swapping extra fast as opposed to these sort of general um, hard drive management techniques, replacement techniques and stuff like that that are used um, with a hard drive. So it may well be that you may want to set up or a particular partition on your hard drive and you then may want to format, format that partition in particular so that it can support swap space. Um, this is actually a technique which is used in a number of Unix systems like 4.3 BSD. They use, currently use swap maps and stuff like that. And I'm not going to, I don't want to go into any particular detail about this, but it's just worth keeping in mind that um, if you specially format uh, a partition to service swapping, you're probably going to get better performance for swapping than you would if you're just using the, gene the general, um, uh, the general uh, disk management techniques that you would use, say, for storing files and stuff like that. Um, other things you might um, consider is for a hard drive is what are you going to do if your system runs out of swap space? Um, you know, the virtual memory is kind of reaches a maximum capacity. Maybe you want to make the partition bigger or something like that. Um, I've actually had some experiences with that when I needed more virtual memory because I was working with a really big program I was trying to run. So then I actually said, OK, shut everything down, brought it up, reformatted the hard drive. I, ex I basically uh, squoze some information out of one partition and added it to my swap partition, rebooted the system, and then I could have more virtual memory, which made me very happy at the time. 
Swamp systems will allow multiple swap spaces, um, but that's a little bit more complicated. We don't need to go into it now, but they, they are possible. All right, I did want to talk about RAIDs. So RAID is an acronym, stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. Um, the, the trick here is you're using multiple disks, at least two, um, but you might have like four or five or 10 or even 100 disks, all kind of working together uh, in, uh, to service uh, a machine or a set of machines. The, redund the R part there is important, it's redundancy. And let's first consider a situation where you have an array of disks, 100 disks, and each of the disks has, on average, 100,000 hours mean time to failure. So on average, uh, uh, within 100,000 hours, a disk is gonna fail. Well, if you take that 100,000 and you divide it by 100, that means that on average, you're gonna get a failure. One of those disks is gonna fail about every 1,000 hours, which is about every 41 and two thirds days. Well, that's not a very long time if you're running a server, because when that happens, that means the whole server goes down. You gotta do something where you, know, you have to, somehow you have to recover the, the disk that you lost, the information that you've lost. So what, when we talk about, when we add redundancy to this, the idea is to uh, increase the mean time to failure. So we, we don't have failure happening, say every 41 days. And of course, if we don't have failures, then we don't have to worry about data loss because the hard drives are there all the time. So let's consider a situation where we're mirroring disks. That is when you have disks where one disk is a copy of another disk. And so let's say we just have two of them. So we have two disks running and one is just a copy of the other one. They both still have this 100,000 hours of mean time to failure. And it takes say 10 hours to repair a disk. So that is if two disks are running, one of them fails, you can still work just off the other one because it had a copy of everything. Now you could bring in a new disk, plug into the system, format it, get it all ready, copy the stuff from the currently working disk onto the new one, and eventually you have a, a copy of the other one, you're ready to go again, and you're off and going. So the only time you get in trouble is if when one disk fails, and you bring in the new one, before you can copy the information from the working disk onto the brand new disk, the other disk fails. In that case, you would have an actual failure. But the probability of those things happening is very, very tiny. You can kind of see the math down here. So you'd need two failures. You have 100,000 squared, and you divide that by two times 10. That's the number of hours that it takes to repair it. And you see that that gives you this gigantic number of hours, or you're only gonna suffer a data failure about once every 57,000 years. And I think we could all live with that setup. So pretty useful in that case. There's also something called uh, non-volatile RAM. A lot of hard drives actually have non-volatile RAM, especially RAIDs have them built in. This is basically a little solid state memory that it has. And basically the writes to the hard drives are queued onto the NVRAM before they actually moved onto the hard drive. And the advantage of that is if you have a power failure before the write is completed, then when the machine, when the RAID comes back up online, the write is still sitting in the NVRAM, and now you can go ahead and you can successfully complete that write. And that should leave your hard drives usually in a much safer state than if you didn't have it. Um, RAID itself is, there's sort of six different levels of RAIDs. Now they actually get different numberings, so the, the book kind of points that out. So the book has a particular numbering it uses, but it's not necessarily canonical. Other folks may uh, do write, write uh, number the RAID schemes differently. Um, all of them kind of have some level of redundancy typically, They and they may also use a technique called striping that's very common. When you're striping data, it means you're basically taking your data and you're splitting the data across multiple drives. So for example, let's say you had, in the simplest case, you had two hard drives. Um, if you're doing block level striping, then what you would do when you're writing your blocks from a file, so say block 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you'd put block 0 on the first drive, block 1 on the next drive, block 2 on the first drive, block 3 on the next drive, and so on. So you're basically spreading the representation, the data of a file, across multiple drives. And that's called striping. The big advantage of striping is speed because now when you want to pull that file back off of the hard drives, you're actually pulling it off of two hard drives simultaneously. And of course the CPU is usually more than capable of keeping up 
with the I.O. because the I.O. is just so slow compared to how fast the CPU and the I.O. buses can work. So you can actually stream the data from both of those drives simultaneously and that means you'll be able to read the file off of two hard drives and basically half the time it would take to read it off of a single hard drive. So striping is where you get speed. That's the big advantage. In terms of, of redundancy, that's where you get safety and protection from data loss. So the simplest kind of protection you can get is just simple mirroring. And when you basically have one hard drive, which is just a copy of another hard drive, whenever you do a, a write to one hard drive, you do the exact same write to the shadow drive or to the mirror drive. So that's just a duplicate of each one. That's called RAID level one. You can also have various schemes um, that do the same thing. They use some kind of blocked interleave parity. Um, so they provide the protection, but they use a little less redundancy. You need a little less uh, uh, extra space. If simple mirroring like you have up here, you basically need twice as many drives as you normally would to store your information because you have to have a complete copy on a copy drive as you do on the original drive. Um, there's different techniques um, using error correcting codes. We'll look at that in a second. That don't need quite as much redundancy in order to provide relatively relatively the same level of safety. Not quite as good, but pretty darn good. Um, and then there's another technique called stripe mirrors or mirrored stripes, which provide both high performance and high reliability, although they come at a relatively high cost, much like the mirroring does before. Um, in general, RAID uh, storage arrays are set up so that when a disk fails, um, there's sort of there, because the redundancy that's built in the replication that's come in, they'll be able to keep running. They'll typically be able to suffer the loss of a single hard drive and still keep working. They won't have to shut down, and that's obviously a very good thing. Um, and also, as I kind of mentioned this before, it's often the case that in a RAID, you're going to have a small number of hot spare disks that are left unallocated. And in this case, if a disk drive fails, then the RAID can go ahead and immediately just swap over to the new spare disk. And while this system is still running and disk reads and writes are happening, um, you're actually rebuilding a copy of the failed hard drive onto the spare. And when that's done, it's basically plugged right back in and you can pick up right where you went off. And that all happens sort of unbeknownst to the user. Pretty cool, but the technique does actually work. Okay, so here's a nice little diagram from the textbook. It shows sort of the six different levels of, really seven different levels of rating, like a six levels of rating. So up here at the top, all of these schemes are sh showing how you could store four disks worth of data. So here is non-redundant striping. So what we've done here is we've taken our four disks and we've striped it across um, all these. So basically each file, the storage of each file is actually spread across all four drives. And as I said before, this gives you kind of maximal speed, really good. The problem is if any of those four drives fails, you've lost everything. So then we can go to simple mirroring. That's RAID 1 over here, where you basically have a complete copy of all of the drives you had over here. So each drive has a mirror drive, which is attached with it. This should be completely safe. You can suffer the loss of any one hard drive and the system will keep working just fine. Hopefully while that drives offline, you can plug in a new one and get things going again. Um, if you use RAID 2, that's using error correcting codes. So it's basically using three extra drives instead of the four we had up here in the pure mirroring situation. And through the error correcting codes that you work with, it's generally possible to satisfy the loss of any one of our four drives here and you can rebuild the content of that lost drive. There's some slight exceptions to that, but in general, you're okay. RAID 3 is bit interleave parity. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. So let's go look at that. With bit interleave parity, we've set aside one extra drive, and its purpose is to hold parity bits. So let me look at the next slide here. So this is a case where I have four drives, and I have one parity drive. So what you can see here is that um, this is the contents of disk zero. So you've got, um, in this case, your data is actually one, zero, zero, one. So you've striped that data across all four drives and then zero, zero, one, one, and so on. So this is the content of each of, each of the disks. Now, what you have over here in the disk parity is you store a parity bit, which is gonna be zero if the number of ones that are in that row are equal are even. 
So you can basically just, you could use an XOR operation to calculate this really fast if you wanted to. But so you've got an even number of ones here, so we set this bit to zero. But looking in this row over here, you've got three ones, an odd number of ones, and so the parity bit for that is one. So here's our parity values over here. Now assume that disk two fails. So we don't, disk two isn't there anymore. And let's say that we then, okay, we had a failure. So we swap the bad disk out, we swap in a new one. At this point, it's actually possible for us to reconstitute what was in disk two before it failed by using the bits that remain. So if you look at what's left here, in this row you've got a one, a zero, and a one. That's an even number of ones. Well, the parity bit was zero, so we know that this must have been a zero that went here to make the parity so. For this guy, let's look at the third row down here. We have a one, a one, and a zero. This is an even number of ones on this row, but our parity bit is one. So we know that this must have been a one over here in order for this parity bit to be accurate to that. Likewise over here, this must have been a one here because the parity is zero. I should have an even number of ones, but this row only has one now, so this should have been a one. And over here, I need an odd number of ones, but there's no ones here, so this should have been a one here. So basically I can reconstitute the missing drive just by looking at the, at the parity bits. And of course, if the parity drive had itself failed, it'd be easy enough to swap in a new drive for that because then you could just look at the existing, the other four drives and recalculate what the parity bits are supposed to be. So that is how bit interleave parity can provide um, redundancy. And you still get a good level of speed from that as well. Now the downside of that is you've got to basically you have to um, stripe a bit at a time, which is perhaps not as efficient as it might be. There's also block interleave parity. Works very similar to the bit interleave parity. I won't go into it. And then the book describes two other techniques, block interleave distributive parity and RAID 6. And the idea here is that you basically have redundancy and parity scattered across all of the disks. So it's kind of a mix of that. And that gives you RAID 5 and RAID 6. Okay, so RAID 0 plus 1 and 1 plus 0, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, um, but the basic idea is you're, um, you're striping your data just as you had before. So here you've got stripe data and you're just copying your stripe data again. So you have a set of a, a mirror backup over here. And you can also do it the other way where you basically mirror individual pairs and then you're going to stripe across those pairs as well. Again, this requires twice as many disks as um, you would normally have if you didn't have a RAID. Um, but you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get um, good speed because of the striping and you get good protection because of the redundancy, because of the mirroring. Other things you can stick into RAID technology, um, you might be doing snapshots. A snapshot is kind of like a checkpoint um, of a file system before you're gonna make some significant changes to it. It's sort of a way of um, memorizing, storing a recording of the status of the hard drives in a sort of a safe place Every so often you do that, kind of like a backup almost. Um, and then if the system crashes, you can roll back to the previous snapshot and get basically the file system back before things happened. Um, to provide real security, you're typically gonna want, if you're really worried about things, then you're gonna want your mirroring or your duplication not just to recur, not to occur just between the drive sitting in a RAID, but you're actually gonna want the mirroring to occur all the way to another site. That way, if the location where your RAID is stored, say Ann Arbor, happens to burn down, then hopefully you've got a copy, a mirrored image of your RAID on a completely different site, maybe in like Lansing or something like that. And that would sort of provide uh, the maximum protection for disaster recovery. And for uh, uh, systems, for situations where we're really concerned about recovery, you might put them in a completely different state, a completely different country, whatever. But the further the apart the sites are, the less likely they can suffer the same kind of disaster at the same time. So for example, if you're living in uh, in South Florida, you probably wouldn't want your two sites, one to be in Miami and one to be in Fort Lauderdale because if a hurricane hits, it might actually whack both of those cities. And I already talked about the RAID being used to automatically swap in hard drives, which is pretty cool. And the only thing you have to worry about with the swapping hard drives in is you gotta, as a system administrator, you wanna kinda keep track of how many of my supposedly spare hard drives have been used up because if my spares are getting small, I need to swap out bad ones and swap in new ones so they can become the new spares. So that's the end of chapter 10. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and we'll do well.